We heard before, you know, we all uh, took time and we all uh, were, were uh, very uh, eagerly coming to Zermatt, to this peaceful place, and I can imagine that the next speaker uh, also did that because he lives in the United Kingdom. So uh, a place which uh, gives us a lot of news uh, in, uh, lately. Uh, we have the Dean of the University of Kent, a political scientist here, Adrian Pabst. And uh, he's been very interested in questions of ethics, very interested in uh, the question of values that we just heard. How do they um, uh, affect politics and how could we change the values within politics and also, of course, the economy. Uh, there's a book of him uh, that you can, you can uh, buy at, the, at uh, the bookstore as well, The Demons of Liberal Democracy. I was just leafing through uh, the content, and uh, he speaks about democracy, oligarchy, democracy, anarchy, and tyranny. Uh, if you followed the news from London the last week, I thought we had all in there. Uh, within one week, we've had it all. And uh, we've, we've experienced quite uh, some turmoil times. And uh, sometimes it's good to hear from an expert uh, how we can get out of these and how we could change maybe our way of thinking. In that way, we're very happy to have him here. Please welcome Adrian Pops. Thank you. Uh, Well, thank you uh, so much for the uh, very generous uh, words of welcome. Um, it, it is indeed a huge pleasure being here because, as was just said, um, I, um, I live in the United Kingdom and um, uh, it got so much that I had to escape to Australia for the last three weeks um, because I could only watch this from afar, this moment of collective madness which has not uh, come to an end. So I will... Um, not, not spend much on Brexit, I think. Uh, I will try and elevate, uh, I think, the level, because I think what's been coming out of Britain has been uh, utterly dispiriting. Um, can I say um, what a privilege it is to be here? Uh, it really is, and I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, generosity of the organizers um, to bring me to this really prestigious gathering uh, in such an exceptionally beautiful uh, setting. And my particular thanks go to Christopher. Uh, for, the, for the invitation. Um, let me just summarize my argument uh, so that I hope um, I will not lose you on the way. And the argument is this. The economic liberalism that's been dominant for the last 40 years or so, and I brought about the financial crisis about 10 years ago, is now in such a deep crisis that it lacks legitimacy and I don't think can simply be revived. But this is not grounds for pessimism or for hopelessness, just the opposite. It is in fact hopeful change because concrete available alternatives anchored in the common good are there for us to take advantage of, to embrace and to make real. And when I say common good, I don't mean anything very vague, and nor do I mean an imposition of some uh, value or some conception by a small group onto everyone else. On the contrary, the common good combines individual fulfillment, so what makes us happy as persons, with the flourishing of everyone else. So it's always reciprocal and relational and it's based on the dignity and the quality of all. Now, again, you might say, well, that's quite abstract, but I don't think it is. It's basically about reconciling the strange interests, bringing interests together that aren't negotiating or talking, but should be. So reconnecting finance to the real economy, because that actually makes finance more sustainable, less volatile, and hence more profitable over the medium and long run. Linking innovation to stable growth, so that actually it serves our human needs and interests, and not just the interests of small vested interest. But it also means bringing together workers and businesses, urban and rural areas, young and old, those with academic degrees and those with technical or vocational qualifications. So all of the groups that are very divided, not just in Britain, but also elsewhere. But I want to start uh, my talk with a uh, short tale, a tale of two cities. And this is the tale I want to tell very briefly. Several years ago, the Senegalese football player, Papi Sisse, became the center of a controversy when he refused to wear his team's branded kit, so his football shirt, which uh, bore the logo of Wonga. Now, you may not know Wonga, but Wonga is a payday loan company that sponsors his football club, Newcastle United, in the northeast of England. Now, Wonga, a payday loan company, began its landing with an effective annual percentage APR of 4,000%. Okay, most of us pay maybe 12 or 50% on the credit card. With Wonga and the payday loan, it's 4,000. Now, like Christianity, Islam also prohibits usury. And Sisa refused to wear the Wonga logo because it offended his Muslim faith. Now, last year, thankfully, I think, Wonga went bust after a cap on interest rates was introduced 
and ruined its business model. And that was compounded by a huge wave of compensation claims and a sustained campaign against basically legal loan sharking, the sort of thing we tried to outlaw, but that somehow had crept back into the system. Because, of course, when you target vulnerable borrowers with small loans, it all seems fine, except when they sp spiral out of control. And one of the principal campaigners against the practices of Wonga was the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who draws on Catholic social teaching to make the case for an ethical economy. He has described the body of Catholic social thought, and I quote, as a huge treasure for the whole church to learn from, and also as one of the greatest treasures that the churches globally have to offer. And I'll come back to this a little later. But what I want to suggest is that the contemporary economic model does not always serve the common good. In fact, often it doesn't serve it at all. Because what drove us to the financial crisis was something that Wonga, in some sense, rec um, exemplifies. And that is the greed of some reckless executives and some shareholders, basically wrecking what used to be a building society and turning it into something that became uh, itself usurious. So the building society that used to sponsor Newcastle United actually gambled with the deposits of its, um, of its clients. And instead of making it available for mortgages, it decided to borrow cheaply in international money markets and thereby inflate the balance sheet. And so when the subprime crisis hit America and led to the global credit crunch, those markets froze and basically lending between banks uh, was cut and even froze up. And then Newcastle United's previous sponsor, Northern Rock, basically had to be bailed out. Okay, it was the first bank to be nationalized in 150 years in Britain. And it took 40, million, sorry, 40 billion US dollars to bail it out. What this really meant was not just the failure of one particular bank, which is bad enough, especially all the people who had savings in it that weren't protected by the law. It was that an old city was dispossessed, and a century-old football club basically had to exchange its previous sponsor for Wonga. So the financialization of building societies betrayed the original vision of helping people, and it also betrayed people in Newcastle and elsewhere. And the point about this is that there was nothing necessary normative about it. Like all history, this evolution is entirely contingent. It means that basically people made terrible mistakes. There were the wrong incentives and rewards. Incentives and rewards for greed, for selfishness, not for virtuous behavior or the common good. And if it was contingent, it also means that things can be different going forward. But for it to be f different, we, I think, require reckoning with the dominant economic model that has brought us to this point. So let me say something about the limits of liberalism. I think this tale of Northern Rock, a good building society that went bust and was replaced by Wonga, does illustrate some of the limits of liberalism, but also the transformative potential of a vision for the common good. Now, you will say that liberalism means all things to everyone, and I think you're probably right. It is a slippery term. It has many meanings, and I certainly don't claim to provide the only definition. It's also not all bad, and many liberal institutions will survive. The one thing that's just about holding the United Kingdom together at the moment are the courts. The courts are still independent, and they're still functional, whatever happens in Parliament, in political parties, or elsewhere. But I think there is a liberalism that has failed. And that liberalism basically is based on three assumptions. I think we can all recognize them quite easily. The first one is freedom without social solidarity. So it's just the individual freedom to do what we want within the constraints of the law, but not really to care about what sort of social cohesion there is, what it means to others who are perhaps not as powerful, not as wealthy to be able to exercise free choice. The second one is basically that the individual reigns supreme and that the power of the individual is effectively underwritten by the state, meaning that all individual rights have to be secured by something, and that tends to be the central power of the state, which essentially weakens all of the intermediary institutions between the individual on the one hand and the state on the other. Those intermediary institutions are not as powerful, are not as central to our lives, and including to the economy as they should be. I'm talking professional associations, trade unions, universities, local government, all the things that mediate and I think at the moment, as individuals, we're actually quite opposed to the power of the state. And then the third assumption liberalism makes is some sort of quite naive faith in a better future underpinned by a sort of myth of linear infinite progress. The idea that things can only ever get better. And yet we know that they don't. And I think the last 10 years at least have shown us that they don't. Because what is gained 
can just as easily be lost. A lot of progress that is made and is real can actually not continue and sometimes is reversed. Again, let's think of the financial system. Let's think of the environment. There's a green movement. It tried to remind us that we had to protect the environment. Yes, and now, and yet ecological destruction proceeds apace. Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, first elected in 97, walked up, number, uh, walked up to number 10 Downing Street on the day he won to the music, things can only get better. And yet, look at what happened 20 years later. Not even he could have envisaged that we'd be quite in such a mess. Now, it is true that liberalism, as I said, is not all bad. And in the last 40 years, it certainly provided plenty of progress. It's lifted millions out of poverty in emerging markets like China and India. And it has also offered opportunities to many citizens in advanced economies. But let's not forget that there's always another side to that coin of progress. The other side is effectively workers losing jobs or having stagnant or falling wages. The middle class now shrinking for the first time in three generations so that the American dream built on the idea that the middle class is sort of embodies the, you know, the dream of anyone can make it from being you know, a bartender to the president of the United States. Now it's the case that levels of social mobility, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, are lower than even in the 1920s. So there isn't that idea that every generation will be better off than the previous one. Quite the opposite. And then we have profound questions of justice. Because inequalities of power, wealth, and status run right through all of our communities. It's not just the case that people are poor in the countryside and rich in cities. That's far too simple. Every city, every town, every bit of countryside has its enormous inequalities. And again, it's not just to do with wealth. It's often to do with power and with status too. And by status, I don't mean status symbols, not the watches we have, the cars we drive, the houses we own. By status, I mean recognition. That people are recognized for their talents, their vocations, the contribution they can make to the economy and to society. And what we see is that these inequalities of power, wealth, and status really offend our natural sense of fairness. People don't like to see exclusion. We saw earlier the quote from Pope Francis, you know, a throwaway culture. And we certainly don't want to see human beings being thought of as dispensable. As somehow, if someone has lost a job in a steel factory, they can no longer make any contribution to the economy and society. That is not how things should be. And there's one good example from London I'd like to mention very briefly here. And that is the borough of Kensington in London, where on the one hand you have a palace, you have lots and lots of wealthy people either from the UK or from abroad, and within a two-mile radius you also have Grenfell Tower, a big tower block that, as you might remember, two years ago went up in flames and almost 80 people <coughs> perished. That's all within two miles. So let's not pretend London is wealthy and you know, the countryside is poor. That's not how it is. Inequality is everywhere. It defends our sense of fairness, and it needs to be addressed. And so the question is how. And I think liberalism isn't very good, because liberalism does essentially two things. It either tells us we should be worried only about collective utility, GDP, or about individual freedoms. Now, both of these, of course, are important. No one wants to see lower GDP, and no one wants to see a denial or a rolling back of individual freedoms. But they're also not enough, because GDP, in the end, is very abstract. And even per capita GDP doesn't offer a lot of sense, because most people are not at the average. They're either way above or way below the average. And individual freedoms, it all depends on whether you can exercise them. It's all very well to be offered all sorts of opportunities, but do you have the capabilities to take advantage of them? The education, the skills, the experience, the networks. Do you have the sort of culture you need to do well? So often when we hear about individual freedom and free choice, what isn't discussed are the conditions under which choices are made. Because those conditions often are not up for grabs. We are told liberalism is the only model, and that's how the economy will go. So just to wrap up on individualism, uh, sorry, on liberalism in this part of the talk. I think the limits are fourfold. The first problem with liberalism is that in the, it privileges individual rights over mutual obligations. We are told it's all about ourselves, our entitlements, and there isn't really enough about how we have to care for others. How doing well means that we also have to have a stake in other people's success. 
The problem with that also is that individual rights and freedoms tend to clash. My freedoms and my rights might at some point not be compatible with yours. So the question is, who arbitrates those conflicts? And it's not individuals themselves. It's not even groups. It's, again, the state. And so often the state actually is far more involved in our personal and professional lives than it should be. We are now told how to educate our children, how to behave in every single way at the workplace, when actually we should be fostering character and responsibility, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So liberalism, oddly, is actually on the side of a very powerful interventionist uh, and often uh, sort of uh, intruding state. Then thirdly, liberalism has a preference for the individual, as I said, and that means that the dignity of the person and the quest for the common good are just relegated to being private choices. You can care about them if you want, but this is not the value that is upheld in the public sphere. And that also goes, uh, you know, re reaches the uh, world of business, because for some time we were told that it was all about private profit and not social purpose. And you all know Milton Friedman's famous quote, uh, and here it is. There's one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and to engage in activities designed to increase its profits and nothing else. End of quote. But we all know that businesses don't work like this. Businesses are themselves also social organizations. They're, after all, employing human beings. They need trust and cooperation. And you cannot mandate trust or cooperation between people by law or through regulation. There has to be a good entrepreneurial culture that actually builds up trust so that people can be innovative, collaborate, and do the best for themselves and their businesses. I don't think liberalism really encourages this. But I want to move on to the common good, because I think, in the end, that's the biggest limit of liberalism. It talks so much about the individual will that it really forgets that the will also needs to be directed. You know, we're not just free from constraints, there also has to be a purpose to freedom. What are we free for? And I would suggest that the common good is what we should be trying to pursue freely, both as persons, but also together in uh, relationships of trust and cooperation. Now, the common good uh, you know, has a long history. I won't try and retell it here. But I think what matters about the common good is primarily a practice. It is not an abstract idea or principle. It is a practice that is very much linked to the idea of virtue. And virtue itself is a practice, courage. Right? It's not an abstract principle, it's something that you do, or something that you don't do. And the other thing about virtue is that it's not itself an extreme. It's not a choice between one or the other in a very binary way. Virtue is already a middle path. So again, to come back to courage. Courage is a middle path between two extremes. One would be too much courage, which is recklessness, or a lack of courage, which is cowardice. Okay, so you can either have virtue by excess, recklessness, and that's not a good thing. It leads to irresponsible uh, actions, including financial gambling and all the excesses we have seen in the financial services industry in the UK and elsewhere. Or you can have cowardice when people simply don't live up to their own convictions, don't act because they're afraid or they simply don't have the courage to take on injustice or to do something that is for them and for others. And really crucially, both virtue and the common good are not so much about the individual, the collective, as all the relationships that constitute us, where we are in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our countries. And those relationships and the institutions that we are part of are not always perfect. Often they hold us back, they can be oppressive or even exploitative. But we can't do without institutions and relationships. We are not isolated individuals making completely free choices in some vacuum. And the reason why we need relationships and institutions is because ultimately, where else would we learn character? And character is absolutely key to virtue and the common good. It's all about trying to perfect your own character, your own talents and vocations, so that you can then make the greatest contribution to the economy and to society. And what else teaches us character than examples? Examples from others, from parents, from siblings, from neighbors, from people in school, from colleagues, from fellow citizens, and so on. So you, there's no virtue in common good without character, there's no character without relationships, there's no relationships without good examples, and that is really what leadership is all about. And so virtue is actually not moralistic. 
it's not telling people how to lead their lives. It's not imposing one conception of what a good life is onto everyone else. It's essentially trying to say that we should all try and do the best with the abilities we've been given. Now, we should try both individually and collectively to work out what that vocation or talent is we have. And not to think there's a single model of success. We don't all have to become university educated to do well. There are lots and, jobs, lots and lots of jobs that are really crucial to our economy that require very high technical skills or even some very high manual skills. And often they are more vocational than academic. And we need to encourage those as well, especially in an era where automation and artificial intelligence will eliminate a lot of the jobs in the middle. But where what will be needed are, are lots of human skills. And those human skills can be very practical ones, and they can also be skills that involve human sentiments, moral sentiments like sympathy. Because after all, do, do we really want to be cared for by robots? Or do we want to actually be cared for by people who have an understanding of our human nature? And the point about the common good is that it's not one thing at the top that everyone has to somehow achieve. The common good is essentially lots and lots of particular goods. Goods which are internal to human activities, like being a good parent or a good neighbor or a good colleague or a good citizen or to be a good worker or a good entrepreneur. That's where the, the good is to be found. It's not some abstraction, it's the most concrete, tangible thing. Because we all know the difference between being a good and a bad parent, a good and a bad colleague, and so on. And we may well have disputes and disagreements, but there is a sense in which we cannot do without that sense of goodness, and that we all have to try and aspire to it. So really, the common good, in the end, is something where we come together as persons embedded in institutions and relationships. And it essentially is the good of each and every one of us, as we concretely are, not some abstraction. And here, it's crucial to make the difference with GDP. Okay, GDP is what? The aggregation of the value of all goods and services produced at any one point, right? in, say, in a year in a particular country. That would be your GDP or GMP. Fine. Very important to know how rich a country is, but it doesn't tell us anything about the distribution. And crucially, it doesn't tell us anything about the goods that we actually hold in common. So not individual goods and services that we can measure, but all the relational goods. And those relational goods are really key to our flourishing. So let me just talk about those for a minute. Natural resources. We heard from the mayor about air, water, right? the countryside, the mountains here, lakes uh, in Geneva and elsewhere. Now, these are really crucial to everyone, and yet they are neither purely private nor often just owned or controlled by the state. They are common or should be common. And how we think about common resources is going to be one of the big challenges in the 21st century, especially when it comes to water, but also increasingly energy. But then we have cultural relational goods too. Knowledge, public buildings, other forms of inheritance that we also need. So when you have a business, often there's some history to what that business produces. How to, for instance, brew beer. I come from a uh, family of brewers. And there's a long art and tradition of how to produce beer. And these things are inherited. They can't just be invented overnight. There will be innovation but within a certain institutional and cultural setting. And these things are often both intangible and tangible. There will be machines, there will be books, but there will also be the, the craft. And that needs to be learned and needs to be inherited and transmitted. And GDP doesn't measure any of that. It only measures the outcome, but not everything that's gone into this. Then we have more, strictly speaking, economic resources, investment in activities that benefit us individually and as groups and societies, health, education, transport, housing, all of the things, again, we need to lead a meaningful life. And finally, we have social resources, the sort of institutions and relationships through which people participate in the economy and society and flourish. And that involves, again, trust and cooperation. And these things, again, can't really be measured. They can't be mandated by the law. They need to be nurtured. And so the common good, to conclude on that part, is essentially all the goods we hold together. That could be friendship at one end. It could be language that we use in order to work together or live together, but also common land or indeed what we call social capital, right? trust, cooperation, all of the things we need for businesses to flourish.
And really the key thing here is not to think of those goods as just transactional, but to put the relational first and to then think how transactions within a relational framework can be better. So we need less regulation and less compliance if there are greater relationships of trust. Because within a culture of trust, you don't need as much compliance and you don't need as much regulation from the outside. And wouldn't we all want less regulation? And wouldn't we all want less compliance? But of course, we can't just abolish it and have all sorts of abuses. There needs to be a sense in which people will be held to high standards. And that starts with essentially the standards within a business. So if you can nurture a culture of trust and cooperation with some element, of course, of control, then your business will be better off because you won't have to spend so much on compliance and so much on regulation. In the end, this comes down to the question of reciprocity. Do we think that we're all in some kind of zero-sum game where there will be winners and losers, and the, the total is basically zero? Or can we actually think of a way where it can be mutually enriched and mutually benefit? And reciprocity isn't just linear. It isn't just, here's a transaction that makes you better off and me better off, and that's it. It's actually an upward spiral. It's about trying to grow a new entrepreneurial culture where we stop with short-termism, we stop with short-term profit maximization, we think about the medium and long-term, optimizing profits and growth, and avoiding the huge volatility, the huge peaks and troughs that have been so damaging in finance but also elsewhere. Now, I've got about five minutes, so I will want to uh, say something maybe more concrete than so far, in other words, give a few examples, I think, of how the common good can be pursued, even if we can never fully achieve it and it will always remain an aspiration. So I think in relation to business, the common good is essentially by encouraging shared prosperity and more stable and perhaps sometimes therefore lower annual profits, but at least more stable profits over time so that we don't have huge crises quite as often as we do. Now, one interesting example, I think, here is shared value. The idea that you want to look at value creation along the whole chain, from suppliers all the way to consumers, and not just to think that businesses can't do better than corporate social responsibility. Shared value is very interesting because it essentially forces you to think, where do you actually generate real value? Value that makes a difference to the economy and society, not just merely financial abstract value. That will be important, but that can't be the measure of all that businesses do. Now, shared value is very much thinking in relational terms, not trying to squeeze your supplies to the nth degree, because you may end up with pieces that are not reliable, not to try and push wages down to a, max, to, to a minimum level, because then you'll have an unreliable workforce, not to try and say, well, outsource production, because again, that might lead to all sorts of externalities, to actually try and think where you can generate and create sustainable value over time. I think the living wage is an important idea because your workforce will only be reliable, it will only be productive, it will only be innovative if the wage you pay them actually enables them to feed themselves and their families. If people have to hold down two or three jobs, it's unlikely they will perform any of those properly. So yes, there will be a cost but often, the living wage actually yields very good results very early on. In London, there was an interesting initiative of which Blueprint for Better Business was a part, where both City Hall, so the municipal government of London, and some very large companies paid the living wage voluntarily. There was no regulation, there was no law. It, they were basically persuaded by the case. And they had lower staff hiring and firing, so greater retention, which reduced their costs, more happy and therefore more productive and more innovative staff. Yes, there was an upfront cost, which is why often small and medium-sized businesses can't always do that, but certainly the larger ones could, and it's turned out to be a good thing, and they carried on. There's still no legal obligation to pay the living wage, and yet that's what's happened. Then I think we also need to think how we can have better pricing, where we internalize all the externalities that are currently left out, whether it's transport cost or other externalities like pollution, which really should be reflected in the cost base. Because at some point, we will not escape that. And isn't it better to do it voluntarily and by your own accord than later on to be forced by regulation? Because again, I think regulation is always a sign 
that someone isn't doing what they really could be doing themselves. It's second best, often third best. And so rather than facing regulation further down the line, it's better to be proactive and to do something that you can actually have agency and control over. And then I think there is ways in which we can also uh, infuse the law. Because the law, like regulation, is not always to the advantage of businesses. But I think we could think of legislation, for instance, rewriting company law to strengthen the social purpose. So there isn't just at the bottom of the list and one of the things we have to do, but actually where entrepreneurs embrace the social purpose. Because businesses are social organizations. Right? They're based around human beings. And in the end, they only do well when a large number of people working in it do well. And so we can actually find ways through the law and through business culture to privilege virtuous action, honesty, loyalty, generosity, hard work, but also being rewarded for all of that, rather than legislation or entrepreneurial cultures that encourage vice, that encourage greed, selfishness, distrust, and maybe even conflict. Because again, the costs of that in the medium and long term will be much, much higher than the cost of being virtuous however difficult that might be in daily life. So just in 30 seconds to wrap up. I think there's a saying, uh, where there is a will, there is a way. I think it's actually just the other way around. We should point out that there are ways, and I think in many ways we can then shape the will. There are concrete alternatives, and we can generate the critical mass of people who will embrace them and who will make them a reality. So I may not be the most optimistic person standing here in front of you, because I don't think it will happen necessarily, but I remain hopeful that it can happen. Thank you very much. Of course, a couple of questions. Thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, maybe we give you more, uh, five more minutes for questions, maybe one from the audience as well. I promise we're not talking about the Brexit. <laughs> Quite interesting. I was alluding to the VUCA times at the, at the, at the moment, uh, the, the very complex time, and made me think, you talked about the, the tale of two cities, and that made me think of the book of Dickens, which uh, famously in the 19th century started with the, with the one sentence, it was the best of times, yeah, it was the worst of times. times. So we learned from that, it's nothing new. Mm -hmm. The times have always been complex. Right. Therein lies the question, uh, where's the responsibility of, of, of the society and the responsibility of business? Uh, you were quoting Friedman as well. Of course, there's a very interesting initiative going on. Uh, quite recently, the top 200 CEOs of the United States uh, uh, trying to make an end to that shareholder value and trying to talk more about values and more about uh, the ethical principles. Does that make you more hopeful? Do you think that's a good sign? Or is it, as some critics said, just pure PR? Look, I think there's always a danger that it's pure PR. And you know, my reservation about corporate social responsibility is that while, again, the intention might be noble, often it's little more than window dressing. So I think we have to be very, very careful that it doesn't just slide into pure PR. That it's not just about sending a good, out, you know, a good sort of feel message, mm -hmm. but a little structural changes happen. But I think you have also have to start with people's intentions. And I think on the whole, they are good. I don't think people are naturally selfish or greedy. I think there's a certain system, a certain set of incentives and rewards that make them more greedy and selfish than they otherwise would be. Look, as you said, times are complex and our human nature is conflicted. We are capable of great acts of generosity and we're capable of great acts of selfishness. All of us in our daily lives all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think it's about trying to encourage the better you know, angels of our nature, Stephen Pinker would put it, but he's, I think, hopelessly naive about progress. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's trying to say, look, because we are capable of vice, we are capable of, of bad behavior, we need to also be clear how to confront it so that it doesn't get out of hand. So I think we need to both tougher on vice and encourage virtue more. And if it can be done through things like rethinking shareholder culture, mm -hmm. then I think that's a good start. But it has to be followed through. It can't just be you know, a little PI exercise and everything will go back to normal, because the normal doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I think we've now seen 10 years of the normal not working. And we should not think that we can just restore what happened before the financial crisis. It would not be good. And I think the lessons have to be learned. I think businesses, again, can be very proactive here, rather than waiting for the regulators or the legislators to act. So we should judge them by their actions more than by their words. Uh, can I ask, is there a question in the audience? We'll, let's give it uh, one or two more minutes, because it's highly interesting. You're still warming up. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, I can't. Yes. 
Well, whatever. Ah, there you go. Sorry. Yeah, now we can hear. You. I was wondering, do you have any examples of things you've witnessed that you can share that sort of show the kind of world you want us to live in? Yeah, so I think one example would be those businesses that embrace shared value, where I think they think much more holistically along the value, you know, the the create the whole global supply chain. I think there are some examples where businesses have started to do this, but there's another example which I find more interesting, and that is where social enterprise you know, do a real service that neither the state nor, if you like, the pure free market would deliver, and yet they do it in ways which are cheaper than either state or private solutions. So there's one social enterprise called Participal, and it actually provides some welfare at local level, especially aged care, which is incredibly expensive. And so often either it bankrupts local or national governments because it's so expensive and there hasn't been enough you know, insurance or other provision made, or else it's left to people's ability to pay, which means that some people get very good care and others, you know, no good care at all. And I think what they essentially do is to try and make this a much more localized thing. But they don't run an enormous operation. They basically look at who in the neighborhood right, needs care, who do they trust, can we find people who actually are looking for work, who can be trained. And so I think while small in scale, these are examples of where people don't just pursue a, a large profit, though they need some profit to operate. And so what they will do is they will take a small profit, and if there is more, they will invest it back into training and into helping those who, for the moment, can't pay for care. And I think there are lots of other examples, too, around, for instance, sustainable energy and, and other things, where now, rather than waiting for the legislator, the regulator to act, businesses are already thinking what are both cheaper and more sustainable solutions, because the changes will come. And I think it's a matter of being proactive. And then the final thing I would say is there are also lots of examples where people pay either the living wage or even in some examples the family wage, where you think if someone has dependents, I know they have two or three children, or they have an elderly relative they care for, I will actually pay them more because I can retain them, I value them as a, as a worker, as an employee in my business, and whilst it costs me a bit more, the chances that they will either leave or be unreliable and so on are greater, and those costs will be higher in the end. So even the family wage is beginning to be adopted voluntarily. Why? Because essentially people's needs and interests are not always the same. So we can't treat people as isolated individuals who will all get the same wage no matter what. We have performance pay already, so we individualize that. Sometimes you can also individualize according to need and interest. So these are small examples, but I think they're also real ones, and I think let's see whether they catch on and whether there's going to be more of a critical mass so that more businesses do it and lead by example. So there are concrete examples, which gives me a wonderful transition to the next segment that we're having here, where we will be talking about concrete examples as well. Uh, for the moment, we want to thank Adrian Pabst uh, for his insights, for his ideas, and he's still around if you have a question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.